Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here. And I'm so excited to discuss work style reform and work life balance for women in Japan. My name is Mikiko Nihei. I'm a work life balance consultant, providing consulting services for work style reforms. I'm also a wife and mother. 20 years ago, when I had my first son, I had many battles with my husband. But I just want to clarify that. It was a long time ago, and he's now a supportive partner now, so you don't worry about us, thank you. Anyway, we both worked long hours until we had a baby, but only I had to change my work style. He would come home late at night, so housework and childcare fell on me. Whenever I confronted him, he bore it silently with a bitter look on his face. One day, I realized that the problem didn't lie in our home. It's a structural problem. The same thing is happening in many families. Unless there are changes in the structure, neither the parents nor the children will be happy. I was convinced that the declining birth rate and related social issues has the, uh, the have to be improved. And the key was work style reforms. So I joined a company named Work Life Balance. I'd like to share my slides from now on. One moment, please. If you are interested in today's topic, please feel free to contact us for further information. Now, let me introduce my, our company. We help Japanese companies to create better work environments. By reducing their work hours, we contribute to increased productivity and happiness at work. What makes us different from other consulting companies is that we are practicing work-life balance ourselves. We keep on growing our business without working overtime while using all our paid leaves. Our consultants work while juggling childcare and nursing care or undergoing fatality treatments. They are all active in the front line. We are demonstrating that work-life balance is not just a welfare policy, but an important part of management strategy. Each company we consulted achieved favorable results, including reduced overtime work. Also, to make social reforms, we have lobbying to change the labor laws and proposing new policies and leading social movements to correct long working hours. In my presentation today, I'll share with you historical progress and culture situation, current situation regarding work style reform, the change of related laws and backgrounds, including social movements. In Japan, the first equal employment opportunity law was enacted in 1985. At the time, the goal was to make sure that women who want to work like men could work just as much as men. Not many women could do that. And most of them had to choose between work or family when he had, they had a child. Next, the child care and family care leave law was enacted in 1991. And through several amendments, child care leave periods and benefits has been enhanced. Now, this law guarantees a one year leave for child care and provides an allowance of 50% or more of their salary. Compared to other countries, it's a well developed system, but the status and role of women haven't been improved enough. 
in a corporate culture where overtime work is highly valued, women who take long leaves or work shorter hours are not treated as full-fledged employees. On the other hand, men don't change their work style even after having children. And women are left alone to take care of the family. Actually, this is the real cause of the declining birth rate. Demographic change due to declining birth, line, the birth rate is an urgent issue in Japan. As you can see in the graph on the left, the elderly were supported a large number of young people in the past. But in 2050, it's estimated to change to the right. The number of young people will decrease sharply, and they need to support a large number of the elderly. The labor force will continue to decline, and by 2060, it will be about half of what it is today. The cost is obvious. The burden of housework and childcare is unevenly distributed among women. This is an international comparison of time spent on housework and childcare by husband and wives. Wives on the left side and husband on the right side. Japan is at the top. As you can see, Japanese women work the longest hours doing domestic work, while Japanese men spend the least time of, on housework. Why do Japanese women do such, such so much housework and child care? There are two reasons. One is, in other countries, domestic work has been marketized to do immigration and class differences. But in Japan, this work is done by work women for free labor. The other reason is more important. Traditionally, women are expected to serve their families. Women are constrained by the ideal image of being a good mother, good wife. In this graph, the red line is the number of dual income families. And the blue line is families with full-time housewives. In the 1990s, the number of dual income families surpassed the number of families with full-time housewives, and it keeps going up. The problem is the standard is still long working hours based on the assumption that a full-time housewife will do all the housework. We've been lobbying to put a legal limit on working hours. In briefings to key legislators, the next slide caught the most attention. This is a survey by cabinet office that tracked families who had their first child. The top group is the one where the husband didn't spend any time on housework and childcare. And the bottom group is the one where the husband that spent six hours and more on it. Orange shows percentage of families that had second child. As you can see, the longer the time spent on housework and childcare by the husband, the higher the ratio of the birth rate of the second child. The time and the birth rate are proportional. What is really needed to improve the declining birth rate is men's work style reform. Finally, the government began to seriously address the work style reform. Women's Empowerment Act came into effect in 2016. A breakthrough idea of this law was the requirement to publish indicators whether a workplace is a good place to work or not, such as visualization of overtime hours, difference in years of service between men and women, ratio of female managers, and so on. In terms of average working hours, Japan doesn't appear that long. As you can see in the graph, Japan is a yellow line in the middle. Japan's Average working hours are shorter than those in the United States, showing in green line. But this is because Japan has high rate of part-time workers. 
compared to other countries. Men in full-time employment work very long hours, while women become part-time workers so that they have time for housework and childcare. Next slide, this shows the percentage of workers working 60 hours or more per week, comparing men and women. Working 60 hours means working 10 hours a day with only one day off per week. Can you imagine? The upper green line is men and the lower yellow line is women. The short line on the top with triangle signs shows men in their 30s and 40s. Men in full-time employment, especially in their 30s and 40s, who are facing the challenge of raising children are notably working long hours. Since 2015, we've been gathering signatures of CEOs who support the idea of collecting long working hours from the perspective of productivity and sustainability. We named it the Declaration of Working Hours Revolution. In 2019, finally, the laws for the promotion of work style reforms came into force. It put a legal cap on working hours for the first time. Overtime work exceeding 80 hours per month is now illegal. Though with a lot of exceptions, we know it wasn't enough, but it was a big first step. The remaining issue is people's traditional belief, such as division of labor. Men should work outside to support family income, and women should be responsible for housework and child care. The reality is the seniority-based system is beginning to break down. Salaries are not increasing. It's becoming difficult to support a family on one man's salary. Men need to be relieved from the heavy responsibility of being the only breadwinner of the family. The next slide shows rate of taking childcare leave comparing men and women. Men is the blue line and women is the red line. The rate of leave taken by men appears to be approaching the rate of women, but Please look carefully. The scale of the vertical axis is different for women on the left side and men on the right side. The government must be taking great efforts to create this graph to impress the success of their measures for gender equality. Anyway, in the latest figures, the rate for women is over 80, while it is only 6% for men. The good news is that the number has increased to 13 last year. And yes, it's partly because of our advocacy, I believe. We started another social movement named Declaring Paternity Leave for All Fathers. We collected signatures from supportive business owners and lobbied for the revision of the child care leave law. The revised law will go into force next year, requiring companies to reach out to expectant fathers and encourage them to take childcare leave. On a final note, on a final note, let's look at the current situation. During the pandemic, workers realized the comforts of working from home. No more commuting in the crowded train and more time to reflect. And they are taking a hard look at the company they work for. Japanese corporate warriors are changing how they think about their own lives away from the company. To be a company to, of choice, Japanese companies are facing the need for change. It must be a good opportunity for me as a work-life balance consultant. I will continue to encourage changes so that everyone can manage his life and live a happy life.
Thank you. So good evening and good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about Japan's current situation regarding the work-life balance and gender parity and what we at Poppins have done trying to solve these issues in the last 34 years. So I think we've just seen it with Nihei-san, but let me start with this interesting statistic. The female labor participation rate in Japan has actually reached a record high of 72% in 2020. So that's higher than that of the US and the average in Europe. So that might actually come as a surprise to some of you. So what we're saying here is that Japanese women are working and participating in the work economy. However, um, this was also mentioned that Japanese women spend three hours, 44 minutes on unpaid labor per day, like household chores and childcare, compared to average of 41 minutes of men. So that means women spend 5.5 times as much as men in unpaid labor at home. So women are working more and they have not given up on many of their house chores. So Japan passed this equal employment opportunity law in 85 and yet Japan is still 120th out of 153 countries in the gender gap index, which is just extremely disappointing result. I mean, the reason for this include a low percentage of us are in the managerial roles. So only 14.7% even though 71% of female are in the workforce. There are twice as many women in part-time jobs than men, and the average income of women is 43.7% 43, 43 lower than that of men. So women need options. So the gender gap exists everywhere in the world, as we know, but in Japan, the gap is a lot wider than in other developed countries. And it's certainly not because Japanese women are lazy. We need to do better and give more options to women who have career ambitions and to also care for their loved ones. So what have we at Poppins done about this to help women in Japan? My mother, um, Noriko Nakamura, she founded Poppins in 1985 because she struggled to find sufficient childcare for me. When she was working full time to support her family, she wanted me to have a good education and be cared for with love and affection. She wanted to make sure that she didn't have to live in fear that she was leaving me with a stranger that she wasn't sure she could trust. So at the same time, um, she had or well, at that time, really, she had no other option. And so fortunately, my grandparents were there to save, but she said that she still felt guilty about leaving me with them for missing home responsibilities because of work. She said the pressure of cultural stereotypes of not just being a stay-at-home mom, but being a perfect mother was just so much, it nearly crushed her. She knew that there must have been hundreds, thousands of mothers who felt the same way. And she wanted to be given a choice, a choice to send me to a good nursery school, a choice to have somebody she trusted to come and pick me up from school, a choice that she didn't have to burden her parents. So Poppins was founded from the very needs that my mother experienced firsthand. So then in 1996, Poppins launched our senior care service, and this comes from when my grandparents fell ill and when they needed care, we saw firsthand how limited the choices were to look after the elderly at home. The hospital was not happy with the option for them to go home to spend the remaining days because they couldn't be responsible. So in the end, we actually had to write a pledge saying that we would not blame the hospital if my grandparents died due to lack of care at home. So this terrible experience turned out to be the very reason why we started a nursing care service at home. My grandparents needed care, sure, but not necessarily hospital care. So when I took a break from my career in the UK to come back and help look after my grandparents, I did it not for them, but for me. 
to have an opportunity to thank them for raising me for all these years and caring for them myself every day. And that's when I realized I just, I wanted to be part of this company because I too realized that there must be thousands of people who are in the same shoes as me thinking there must be another way. There, there must be another options, better options. So our children, our parents, or in my case, grandparents too, um, these are perhaps the only people we care more about than ourselves. Well, actually, sorry, husband, maybe husband too. So we needed, what we needed was different options available for women to help women care for their loved ones and stay and thrive in the workforce. So currently at Poppins, um, we offer three lines of services mainly. Um, so we have the in-house care service business, which is the childcare and elderly care. And then we have educare business, which is nursery schools and after schools. And then we also have training and others. And these were set up to help women to be able to make a choice on how they live, a model to enable mothers to continue on with their career path. So for example, childcare shouldn't just be about sending children to nursery schools, but it should also include at-home care, babysitters and nannies and house chores. The same applies for elderly care. As more women have children later on in their lives, the need to look after the children and their parents may not actually happen sequentially, but at the same time. So we need to address the issue on both ends of the spectrum. So we've lobbied to make these services available to all spectrum of the society. And the government has although slowly done certain things to improve the current situation, such as reducing the number of children on the waiting list on the daycare. Um, I think in the recent figure shows, according to uh, Ministry of, of Health, Labor and Welfare, the number of children on waiting list for nursery school in 2020 was approximately 12,000, a decrease of 13,000 in three years from 2017. So less than half of the total. So they have promised to increase the wages for nursery teachers, they're subsidizing babysitting fees and promoting paternity leaves. For elderly care workers as for childcare workers, salaries will be increased by around about 3% from next February. So I mentioned earlier about the low, low percentage of women in managerial roles. The average number of females on the board of directors of blue chip companies in Japan is 8.7%. So in the 300 public companies with the highest market cap, there's still 43 companies which have zero female directors on their board, 43. So as for Poppins, um, we actually have 40% of the board of directors. I think we see in the next slide, yeah. Um, and 78.5% of managerial roles are women. And so when we were listed as the first SDGs IPO in the first section of stock exchange last year, investors commented that there are very few female presidents of listed companies at TSE. Well, in fact, only two in history, including us. And even rarer to have female presidents for two generations. So as you know, Japan has one of the fastest declining populations in the world. It's said that by 2060, over a third of our population will be 65 years or older, compared to 21% in US and 17% in India. Our birth rate is falling, and like many other developed countries, women are having children later. So as I mentioned before, we're doing our best to make it easy for women to stay in the workforce by providing childcare and senior care. And what else can we do? Yes, uh, change in immigration is one, and I'm sure this will happen eventually, but unfortunately not quick enough in my view. So what else can we do? The answer still lies in understanding women and their needs. So as for work style reforms, I think we can all agree that COVID pandemic has changed the way we work globally. People were commuting less on the infamous bad trains in Japan. 
many of us reflected on the meaning of work, life, realizing the importance of balance, or being praised for work, non, so working longer hours, that sort of prioritizing work over life or family has, I think, started to, well, starting to change. And so we all needed to adapt quickly. And I think if there's a silver lining in this pandemic, it's very much the company realizing that we can indeed work from home quite effectively and productively. And I think this too gives women an option in terms of choosing how and where they work. So I've been talking about having different options for women a lot today. And uh, I think it's, it's also very important for women to have the power to choose, not just having options, but the power to choose, to make that decision without the fear of being judged by their husband, parents, in-laws, friends, work and society. We need to make having these options the new standard. And so I hope to see the younger generation such as um, you know yourself, the students, I hope who are joined today um, to become leaders, to come up with new ways of evolving. I'm sure um, so many of you will go on to set up or lead a company in the future. And I just wanted to share two key concepts that have shaped the way we do business. And this may not work for everybody, but it certainly shaped my world. So the first concept is to learn from your own experience and to focus passionately on solving problems that you know at first hand. Being a party to the problem is the greatest asset of all. Nobody would understand the problem you're solving better than the person who's facing it. So this is what my mother did when creating Poppins. I too have used my personal experience as a mother and a daughter to put myself in my client's shoes and understand what they need. It's a powerful tool and a powerful motivator. And I think women are well placed to solve women's problems for the future. The second concept is about purpose. So ask yourself, what is our purpose in this society on this planet? A purpose-driven business is not only adding value to the society, but also creates proud and passionate employees. Always question yourself and your company's purpose and you don't lose sight of it, even when your company grows. And so although ours is primarily to support empower working women, it's not just exclusive to them. We're currently focusing on women just because they're the best conduit to better families and the educators of future generations. So through care and nurturing, be it to our children or to our elderly, we give women and men options and space to further enable their families and our future generations to have a better well-being. Thank you very much for today. I am Shimata-san. I feel very honored and humbled to participate in this webinar with a, with a global audience. I honestly wonder if my experience is worthwhile for this large audience on such an important topic as one chosen for the today's webinar, but I will, will do my best. Truthfully, my professional journey has been built up step by step without any clear path or objectives from the beginning. After graduating from senior high school, I entered a school to become a chef. While studying, I became interested in French cooking, and thanks to my school, which had a branch in France, I had the opportunity to go to France for one year. I studied at school for six months and had six months for work experience in a three-star Michelin restaurant. At that time, I learned not only French cuisine, but also the French language. That was the turning point of my life plan. By being invited to meals with French families, I studied understanding how enjoying a meal together creates a happy atmosphere for a family. After coming back to Japan, I worked for 15 years in two old traditional restaurants. Since my experience in France had broadened my horizon, 
After working 15 years in a restaurant, I became frustrated, and it became apparent that I was not doing what I truly wished to do. Cooking and French cuisine were, of course, foundational for me, but I had also learned how French people enjoy family intimacy around a meal together, and how friends became closer in the warm atmosphere of a shared meal. I wanted to teach Japanese families the way French people enjoy simple but delicious meals together. As I continued to, to, to study cooking, the French language and French culture, the purpose of my profession became clear to me. It is to introduce people to the unique pleasures that a cozy meal at home with family can provide. Traditionally, in France, families gather around simple homemade dishes to talk to each other and spend time together as a family. I knew I couldn't pursue my purpose by working in a restaurant, since the setting was too formal with too many restrictions. After some thinking on what I really wanted to do, I decided to leave my job and work as a housekeeper in order to be able to work directly with families and, and to share with them my humble concept of what, what I thought was a source of relaxation and happiness. Being a housekeeper has a, a negative connotation and is considered a low-level job in Japan. And at first, I didn't feel comfortable with it. I applied for a job as a housekeeper at a home helper dispatching company whose clients included foreigners living in Japan since I, I wanted to work with French families as a babysitter to practice and learn more French. At first, I mainly worked doing various household chores, but because of my background and ability to cook French, Japanese, and many other cuisines, very quickly, my cooking was requested more and more. My clients were mostly women in need of help at home while working, raising children, and leading a hectic life, trying to cope with the numerous tasks of a working mother. These women were exhausted by all the responsibilities they had. They barely had time to cook for their family, let alone enjoy the family mealtime, which I strongly believe is a foundation of happy family. I could visit as many as three families a day. Soon enough, the clients sent comments praising me for, for the many dishes I cooked in a limited time that they could store and enjoy throughout the whole week, which saved them time and enabled them to sit at the table and enjoy, it, and enjoy eating with family. I don't require any particular ingredients to be bought in advance, and I don't men make many any menus in advance. I just opened the refrigerator and re quickly looked through what was available in the house. Then I visualized what this is I could prepare. That became my signature style. And that's how I came to understand that this was a way I could realize what I wanted to do. Helping people, giving advice on how to create a family life through cooking for them, especially with French cuisine. Some didn't know much about French food, or some had only experienced it at a restaurant, and most people had never thought they could enjoy French cuisine at home. You may have the impression that French, French dishes may be complicated and sophisticated, but at home, French eat simply prepared dishes such as suchus or grilled meats. I could give my clients a possibility to enjoy 
them at home simply with common ingredients. I was delighted to have left my restaurant career. Since then, the world has spread. More and more demons have poured in. After one year of working this way, a television program contacted my company, and that's how very unexpectedly I was on television for the first time. What was attractive and new to people was that I could immediately visualize many recipes by just looking at the ingredients given to me, and in quite a short time. Soon after seeing the program, a publishing company contacted me to publish a cookbook with my recipes. That was five years ago. Since then, other television channels have invited me to join their programs, and many publishing companies have also asked me to publish new books with new recipes. I continued experimenting and introducing new recipes so that people can enjoy a variety of quick, simple, and healthy recipes. So far, I have published 16 books, and I continue to be asked to appear on TV. Recently, I have been invited to be a recipe advisor to major Japanese companies like Source Source Company Kikoma. I also hold cooking classes in different places in Japan, as well as conferences. There are many famous chefs and people in the world doing research in cooking and providing knowledge on a higher level than my modest personal chef and family advisor status. But for me, the objective remains the same. I am not doing this work for the fame. I just want to focus my professional development by bringing happiness to families by reducing cooking and household burden for women, and teaching them how to mix French and Japanese cultures. In the same way, my husband is French, and he has taught me so, so much about building a happy family in the French way and in his own way. This is what I explain every time I, I have the opportunity to speak in public the pleasure of a meal together, tips on cooking, how to choose a menu, basically how every woman can perform ordinary but enjoyable cooking without putting in too much time or effort. I also like to speak to young people who have decided to become chefs help them to, to help them see another aspect of, of the cooking profession. Through TV programs and other public events, I try to reach more and more people to share my work and life philosophy so that they can see alternate alternative to Japan's traditional ways. With my husband and three small children, I can rely on my family to build a foundation to continue developing in the future. Thank you very much for your time. So my first question for all of you, um, I would love to hear your rating uh, on Japan uh, on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being the perfect environment, uh, one not so great. Um, you know, where would you rate Japan's work-life balance status? Uh, when, tell me how you arrived at this score. Um, what, what are your thoughts also in the future, maybe 10 years down the road, what do you see uh, here in Japan? And will the change come rapidly? Uh, slowly and why? Um, perhaps Miss Nihei, uh, you could start off, and then uh, Miss Todoroki, and then Miss Tasan. Thank you. It's an interesting question. I'll give it a four. Uh, I think work-life balance in Japan is getting better than it used to be, but the speed of change is very slow. The reason is. Most of Japanese organizations take a point reduction approach. So people think it would be better not to take on new challenges rather than make mistakes. 
But in this pandemic, people come to know it's impossible to get a good solution without repeated trial and errors. Companies are forced to be more flexible and they are allowed their employees to work from home and so on. Now we have learned that we should always take on new challenges. And that's how we promote work-life balance in Japan. So about future, I hope the score will be 10 in 10 years. And at that time, our company's mission will be completed. So we happily deserve our company. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, so I think, well, since the pandemic, um, I think there's been some definitely positive progress. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd really say we're only halfway there. So I'll say five. Um, in the last, well, I think in the last 10 years, I think um, things have progressed a lot quicker than expected. For example, sort of the traditional belief that longer you work, a better um, worker you are, or it's better to work for the same company for a long time. I mean, these thoughts are slowly, but like definitely starting to diminish. Um, in 2020, uh, Poppins, we've actually set up this overtime policy limiting um, employee to, to seven hours a month max. So almost zero sort of overtime policy, including um, our 6,000 sort of, you know, staff on the nursery schools and everything. And so that took some, um, you know, effort, but I think people's, you, you really need to just set a target and then just stick with it and take that leadership and you do it yourself and then show that it can be done. Um, so uh, the baby boomers have mostly, I think, retired and now stepping away from this working age population. So the concept, I think, the generations are changing. The concepts which are important to the younger generations are more like inclusion, equality, uh, well-being. And so um, I think with those uh, sort of the changing generation, uh, the mindset, the culture, I mean, with respect to what's been happening in the past, I think we can hopefully take step by step to, um, to a better, better future. So uh, I hope, like Nihei-san just said, uh, to be able to reach 10 in 10 years. Um, and so that we become, you know, number one in gender parity gap <laughs> in the uh, in the world, yeah. Thank you. And next, Ms. Tasan. Hi. えっと、私は英語が得意ではないので通訳の方に頼もうと思います。えっと、私は家政婦の仕事を通じていろんな家庭を見てきましたけども、その中でやっぱり女性がほとんど家のことを so because um, working as a housekeeper for families, I could witness how, what, what was the real situation at home and how the wives uh, were doing actually all the chores at home. And that made, made my, um, that was I could witness actually. <laughs> その一方で、あの、私が知り合うそのお母さんたちはすごく自分の好きな仕事をしていて生き生きしているようにも感じます。そういう意味で、あと私は10、えっと10のうち5だと思っています。あ、そうそう。そうで、で、で、I think my rate is コロナであえっと家に家にいる時間が皆さん増えたと思いますが、あのすごく私はいいきっかけになったと思っています。なのでえっとこれから男性も家のことをする機会が増えたりとか、その女性がどういうふうにえっとその家事をこなしたり育児
thanks to the um, corona, um, we have a happy side of it, which is the, the men had to stay home and work at home and witness more what their wives were actually doing at home and taking care of the children and everything. And that made them more maybe um, understanding uh, in the situation and that will, I hope that will make them change their mind about uh, participation uh, in the family life. And I have a follow up question for Miss um, Tasson. Um, you and your husband, I've seen your husband with the baby uh, carrying sometimes in the background. And so our viewers also had this question as well, which was you and your husband has, so Romaine uh, has this family life and life philosophy that made quite a buzz on Japanese uh, TV. And that episode was aired in actually in the US as well. So I, was, I wanted to hear you know, a little bit more about your unique relationship that you have with him and how his ideas may have contributed to your uh, work philosophy today. えっと、今私の仕事はすごく my work now is thriving and I'm very, very busy. And But this uh, work is also very important, not only for me, but for the family. And my husband is very understanding about that and helping a lot. So we've been discussing a lot about that and uh, that's why we have shared um, well, the, all the responsibilities in the house and uh, we both make it uh, after discussing and uh, after be becoming very uh, agree about the new life we are um, leading together. Mm -hmm. あ、when um, our family went on television, I think that many people have thought it was a little bit strange the way we were living, the husband's home and me working. And uh, But I think um, watching many, many families, every family is different mm -hmm. and everybody has to make their own choice for the life they would like to, uh, to have uh, and, and the good balance they would keep uh, work, between work and, and the family life. Thank you so much. Indeed, you know, we all need like infrastructure in some ways, our personal infrastructure and support group. And, you know, there's some, there's individuality, you know, it's our personal, um, you know, mission and message and that the building that we're doing, especially in the and the family is quite different. So that was very, um, it's very insightful, uh, Ms. Tassan. Um, our next question, this was from our participant who actually gave us this question before the panel. It goes to Ms. Nihei. Um, you showed a bunch of data about Japanese, uh, you know, working hours, um, just crazy long working hours. Um, so why do people, Japanese people work longer um, than normal office hours? And within your own sort of business experience, um, did you find any uh, sort of insights here that you would like to share? Maybe your uh, services have maybe turned around and improved for the better for the individuals or organizations. So we would love to hear your experience in this regard as well. Thank you for that question. One of the biggest factors for long, long working hours is life and lifetime employment. That's now a uh, thing of the past, but culture and customs remain. The employee who can work overtime is highly valued and they can move up in the company. Since people uh, want to work for the company for the rest of their life, they 
are forced to follow such a corporate culture. But I think a more fundamental factor is education. Japanese education emphasis patience and cooperation. Children are taught not to be bother other people and to be uh, considerate of others. And they are not encouraged to be assertive. This is a reason why Japanese are so selfless or obedient in this regard. And as a case, uh, I, I'd like to share with you is a company that has a chain of sushi restaurants. Traditionally, Japanese sushi chefs uh, spend a lot of time to be, become qualified. They must acquire skills from senior chefs just by watching. The seniors don't actually teach them. But after we consulted with them, their corporate culture changed dramatically. Now, to improve their team performance, artisans demonstrate, demonstrate how to prepare fish on webinars, and young chefs can learn it from restaurants across the country. They also started the online purchase of seafood, and they could improve their selection of fresh fish that they have cherished since their establishment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, second to the last question um, goes to Ms. Todoroki. Um, this was for a question fielded by the managing director, Ryoko Ogina, who was so impressed by the services she received while she had her child in Japan traveling. Um, and it's such a high quality services that your company offers. So she had a question, what is the biggest hurdle uh, preventing Japanese people from using outside childcare services? Uh, there is definitely a need for it, but it seems like such services are not yet common in Japanese society. Thank you for that important question. Um, so I think in terms of um, the hurdles, there are probably two that I can talk about. One is definitely the mindset of people. So, you know, the word nanny or babysitter is associated with the wealthy or privileged, as well as traditional views, um, like women should be looking after their own children um, or on their own, or that, you know, children will suffer if mothers are working full time. We have so many legends in Japan, like Sansai Jishinwa, which is three years old legend, that apparently it has to be the mother that to, to raise child until three years old. Those sort of like, um, yeah, I think trap or the legend actually keeps people from um, sort of hesitate to use those services. And secondly, obviously um, it's the cost. So as it's a, it's a very important job where one is responsible for their lives of people. Um, so you need to recruit well, you need to train well, and you need to make sure that, um, you know, they, they go through the right channel in order to be responsible for someone else's life. And so that I think has been a hurdle for the, um, the pricing part. But recently, um, the government has realized that you can't just have nursery schools, you need to have babysitter service or other sort of services to help working parents. So the subsidies are great. They have actually increased and doubled substantially um, since this April. So slowly, but literally it's moving on um, this year. Wonderful. I can't believe the time is up. So we have one last question. If you can make your response as succinct as possible, that would be great. Um, if you were Prime Minister Kishida's advisor, what would be your biggest suggestion to him so the government can make a difference in people's lives? Uh, let's start off with you, Ms. Uh, Todoroki. Um, so I would say that um, my biggest suggestion would be um, on very childcare support and endorsement on high quality service. I think those two are the main pillars that I'd really like to ask Shita-san. Yes. Ms. Tasan? 
、私はと岸田さんがもっとこう家庭で過ごす時間を増やして、えー、と働きながら子育てや家のことをやっている女性たちの女性の、まあ、奥さんのことをあの見てあのどういうふうに彼女たちが頑張っているかというのを知ることが大切なんじゃないかなと思います。So, I think that、um, the Prime Minister, Mr. Kishida, I would、um, recommend him to spend more time at home so that he could、uh, understand more、uh, the chores of the, of the women. And in that respect, that he could, that would prompt him to make improvements for all the women, the working women、um, in Japan. I think that would be a good thing. <laughs> Lastly, Ms. Nihei. I would suggest introducing a selective surname system for married couples. Japan is the only country when a couple gets married, one of them is legally born to change the surname. And it's、uh, about our identity and marriage diversity. Thank you all for joining today,、um, both participants as well as our excellent speakers、uh, today, Ms. Todoroki, Ms. Tasan, and Ms. Nihei.、Uh, we learned so much in such a short period of time. And I would also like to thank our corporate sponsors, individual sponsors. Without their generous support, a webinar like this,、um, especially one dealing also with women's empowerment, would not have been possible. So, on that note,、um, good night, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today.